I welcome you to the afternoon session and will be your host for the final and the sixth session today on the theme of the Indian School of International Relations, an idea whose time has come. Uh, please allow me to introduce and invite the chair for the session, Professor Varun Sahni, to the dais. Professor Sahni is a professor of international politics at the Center for International Relations, Organization and Disarmament at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. May I also welcome the lead speaker, Professor Amita Vacharya, who will be joining us online, along with the discussant, Dr. Atul Mishra. Uh, good afternoon uh, to all of you. And uh, uh, even though the Honorable Minister is no longer with us, uh, I hope the rest of us are here. Uh, because, uh, because this is, I think, uh, quite, quite an important session. Um, and, uh, you know, since two of my colleagues on the, on the panel are, are sort of attending and participating in this remotely, I'm not going to speak uh, at any length to begin with. I may, towards the end, perhaps, you know, if, that, if time permits, say a few things. Um, but this whole notion of an Indian uh, School of International Relations is an interesting question because there was an Indian School of International Studies that was established in 1955 uh, in Sapru House in Delhi, uh, sister institution of the Indian Council of World Affairs. Uh, when JNU was being established, uh, ISIS, ISIS became, you know, the, became essentially a founding school uh, of the, uh, of, you know, so it became the School of International Studies uh, of JNU. And uh, I think all of us on this panel uh, today have uh, at least some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, a debt, shall we say, to SIS, uh, including including uh, Professor Acharya. In fact, it's quite interesting, I was reflecting with Professor Malavarapu that there are, in fact, three generations of, uh, you know, uh, Indian international relations scholarship present on this panel, because uh, Professor Amitabh Acharya, you know, uh, would be a contemporary of uh, Professor Kanti Bajpai, who was Professor Malavarapu's doctoral supervisor. And uh, Professor Malavarapu, in turn, was Dr. Atul Mishra's uh, doctoral supervisor. So, you know, uh, you actually do have, in a very real sense, three generations of scholarship uh, on, on this panel. Um, so here's my thought. I mean, you know, I actually, I've, I've spent almost 30 years now on the teaching faculty of SIS in JNU. Um, and my thought is this, and I've been vocal about this in JNU too. I think the historical failure of SIS uh, was that it did not theorize non-alignment. Um, and I'll be happy to sort of talk about this more, but just sort of as a reference point, you know, um, if you contrast how under-theorized non-alignment is compared to, say, dependency, which was sort of, you know, the response of uh, Latin American thinkers uh, to the fundamentally unequal uh, nature of the international political economy. Dependency, you know, obviously had its policy side, import substitution industrialization, but if anything, dependency was over-theorized, you know, I mean, so you, you can sort of dive into dependency theory and, you know, emerge two years later, you know, having read sort of all of the, so we have nothing similar when it comes to non-alignment. Um, and, 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 you know, I, it seems to me that this is important because if you're asking whether we can have an Indian school of international relations, asking whether this is an idea whose time has come, I'll suggest to you the following notion, and I'd love it if my co-panelists, you know, uh, push me on this. Maybe they'll actually agree. No theory, no school. You, you, can't, you can't build a school without theory. And, and, uh, and, you know, so I think in some ways, I'm delighted to be here at Symbiosis. I've known of this wonderful university for so many years. Uh, but I'm not just saying this as a, the routine curtsy one sort of, you know, expresses towards organizers of wonderful conferences like this. I mean quite really the fact that international relations is now being taught and researched in locations like Symbiosis, like Shiv Nadar, uh, you know, like Jindal Global, like Ashoka, uh, you know, uh, I think is desperately, deeply needed. 
uh, you know, and uh, I just hope that somewhere along the line we can actually begin to start thinking seriously about what would be the theory that would go into sort of, you know, the construction of a school of this nature. Uh, I'll, I'll stop at this point because two of our co-panelists, as I said, are joining us online. And I'll first request uh, our lead speaker, Professor Amitabh Acharya, who is uh, a, 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 an, an almost iconic figure uh, in international relations, in the global discipline, I mean, um, who's distinguished professor currently at American University of Washington, D.C. Uh, I'll request him to first sort of, you know, uh, take, take over. I request him to try to keep his uh, presentation down to half an hour, if he can. I've already had the advantage of seeing his presentation, so I know how rich it is, but I also know how long it is. Um, and, you know, uh, and then after that, we'll turn to Dr. Atul Mishra, who's associate professor uh, at Shivnada University who's also joining us online, and then we'll wrap this up with Professor Siddharth Malavarapu, who is Professor and Head of the Department of International Relations and Governance, also at Shivnada University. So the floor is yours, the microphone is yours, uh, uh, Professor Acharya, please, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Sani. You reminded me how old I am now. Uh, so I'm the oldest of the three generations, um, but it's just like yesterday that uh, I was uh, at JNU, and I remember those days extremely well, my two, three years in JNU. And, uh, and in fact, there is no question uh, that uh, I got my first uh, test of international relations at JNU. Um, those days uh, in India, I studied in Ravensa University, Ravensa Institute of Ravensa College, uh, the only course we did on IR uh, was a course on international law, uh, but there was no other course uh, to do actually theory or uh, uh, any uh, kind of uh, even uh, <clears throat> practical and empirical dimensions of IR. So JNU was the grounding that got me interested uh, and started me on my long journey to in international relations. I am. Uh, very honored by this invitation, uh, but I am very shamed by the fact that I could not make it in person. The Symbiosis University, Professor Lali and uh, others have kindly invited me to go there. Uh, and in fact, the Honorable Foreign Minister, I met in Washington a month ago, a uh, month and a half ago, I said, I'll see you in Pune. Uh, but uh, for various reasons, family reasons, and also this is the end of our term. It's very hard to go away for a week and then come back and still be able to do all your exams and everything. So I decided I could go. So very sorry about that. But I hope I can make up a little bit from um, uh, with my presentation. So I will uh, share some screen, given the fact that, as uh, uh, Professor Sami said, uh, I did uh, prepare a rather longest uh, PowerPoint. Uh, that's because of uh, their benefit. Uh, and I'm hoping they would summarize it, and I don't have to present it um, because uh, <laughs> Professor Mishra and Professor uh, Siddharth Malagrapu would uh, summarize my presentation because they have had it at least for a week or they can critique it. But let me just start by uh, showing a few slides from what I intended to so, uh, speak. And uh, give me a, a minute, a second rather. Uh, uh, okay, I cannot seem to be able to share my screen. So this has to be done by the organizers. Uh, okay, for some reason it's uh, not showing. Oh, okay. Let me see. Indian School of Hoya. Okay. Uh, so let me just lay out my basic arguments first. Okay. Uh, So could I go to my main arguments? Um, so first word, uh, I, I think uh, Varun said that uh, India was an early leader in IR, and that's not just about in India, in the global south, and in fact in the world. Um, so uh, we're talking about uh, not the founding of 19, uh, sorry, 
uh, JMU at our Indian School of International Studies, but the, the study of international relations, the subject of international relations, both uh, as policy, but also as an academic discipline, or, uh, or in a, a theoretical sense, uh, started in India just after World War I, maybe even earlier. Uh, but I will talk about it in a minute. Uh, but let me just uh, say that would be my first article. How this was so? I will highlight some work that uh, some of, of some of you may, may or may not know, but that will uh, improve this point. The second is that, uh, and this is uh, probably the main thing I want to say, uh, the sources of Indian IR thinking and practice are diverse, eclectic, and above all, syncretic. And by syncretism, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Amartya said I uh, had this book called Argumentative India. For me, uh, Indian uh, uh, culture and Indian uh, philosophy is also very syncretic. So I say syncretic Indian. Uh, and you'll find that in history, uh, Indian classical history, Indian literature, Indian culture, uh, and in Indian IR. So the tendency to combine and mix different elements, even after the arguments are done, that's really what uh, defines Indian uh, philosophy and also uh, Indian uh, thinking on IR. But it's also diverse and eclectic. There's no single Indian strand of thinking that I think dominates over all the, over a long period of time. And then I today I see uh, in uh, looking at India, I've not been uh, following Indian IR that closely as some of uh, our commentators uh, and a lot of, a lot of you that are out, out, out there. But I think I see a lot of realism when it comes to policy and practice, uh, especially in uh, New Delhi-based uh, think tanks. And uh, then I see in academia, a lot of post-coloniality. Um, about 10 years ago, 2013 actually, I gave a keynote address to JNU, the Indian uh, Association for International Studies, the Indian Conference on International Studies, where I actually I was amazed uh, that uh, uh, almost 85, 90% of the people, I was a keynote speaker, but I was also chairing a session with then National Security Advisor, Chief Central Manor, uh, who actually said, is there anybody in this audience who is not a post-colonialist? So, and I think in Indian, uh, sort of, it's kind of a branding of IR internationally, uh, is very much a post-colonial one. And it may be changing now, but uh, historically, we see a lot of Indian scholars who have got uh, who have migrated or uh, left, uh, are working in the West. Uh, Post-colonialism of different strands is really what uh, their main uh, theoretical orientation is. Um, and then finally, I'll argue that uh, if an Indian school of IR is to emerge, is to really avoid cultural exceptionalism and embrace pluralistic universalism. Now, I will explain these terms uh, a little more carefully later, but uh, I argue that because of uh, this argument that global IR provides the idea of global IR, uh, which is evolving very rapidly now around the world, uh, provides a very good framing for uh, projecting an Indian school of IR. Okay, so now moving on to uh, my first substantive slide. What is a school of IR? What do you, um, when you see something, how do you know it is a school and not uh, something else? Something just like that. But you're writing an IR cannot doesn't amount to uh, be a to, to being a school unless it sort of exhibits some characteristics. And I think the first thing, as uh, Gaurav Shami said, uh, it must be based on theory, uh, not official policy discourse. So there have been a lot of policy debates, like in uh, Southeast Asia, Asian values, um, and it sort of not only about domestic politics. It was not only about domestic politics, especially in the 80s and 90s but also about, uh, it sits into some academic writings, uh, policy-oriented academic writings, and either directly as Asian values or in some sort of uh, disguise uh, as uh, Asianism, but very much uh, policy-oriented, uh, and it was people like Kishore Mabani, Singapore's uh, uh, public intellectual, Tommy Koh, and also um, to some extent Mahathir Mohammed, have been prime minister of Malaysia, they all started talking about an Asian way of uh, democracy, Asian values, Asian approach to human rights, and there was a substantial body of writing, which I do not consider as constituting any kind of school. Uh, but uh, 
theory can have policy relevance. Theory and uh, practice are not separate completely. But I think the school must start with theory and then move to policy rather than vice versa. And this is where dependency theory, to me, uh, kind of a, is a bit of both. But I think in many ways, it reflected a policy discourse uh, in Latin America. And then I was picked up by academia uh, to become a theory. Uh, but I uh, don't think it was really meant to be purely as a theory. There were a lot of uh, uh, foundations of dependency theory that was based on Latin America's opposition to American hegemony and uh, also uh, the sort of Marxist orientation of Latin American uh, <clears throat> leaders. So uh, then the second thing uh, is that a, a theory or a school must be distinct from existing theories. I mean, uh, meaning the broad theories. So you have realism, liberalism, constructivism, postcolonialism, and uh, critical theories. Uh, but uh, a school, a uh, school should really uh, stand out of this, to present something new. <laughs> Uh, and uh, something that uh, really, it could be linked to all these existing theories, but say something new. And I'll give you some examples of how this has happened in the recent years. Um, so Copenhagen School, Chinese School, uh, these are terms that are being abandoned about and uh, with some success, uh, although sometimes also they fall short. But uh, I think the schools are to be distinct from the broad sort of paradigmatic theories. But it is a, a school is a good way to articulate actually a new approach uh, to international relations, a relatively new approach. Uh, third, it must have a critical mass of followers. It cannot be just one or two individuals or institutions say, uh, this is a, I started a school of thought. Now that will be not only pretentious, but it will also uh, not last very long in most cases, unless it picks up followers. And uh, then it must have longevity. Uh, cannot be just a fact, it comes today and disappears tomorrow. Uh, and that happens a lot uh, in uh, IR theory and some concepts. And, and uh, but but to be a school, it should really uh, survive uh, for a while. And the fifth point, to which uh, I don't know that you can see in the screen, uh, but very very important. Uh, just go back to the previous slide. Uh, <clears throat> number five. Uh, I don't think it's showing in the screen because I cannot manipulate the screen. The fifth point is very important. It must have, it must travel. It must get out of the place where it was created, whether it's a country or university or a region. A, to be a school, a theory must travel. Travel, be applicable not only to that country, that region, uh, but uh, to the globe uh, world at large. It must have applicability. So that means a, you know, an Indian school of IR, Indian school of thought of IR, uh, must be applicable to international uh, system as a whole, and not just to Indian foreign policy or South Asian dynamics. And this is one of the problems of the Chinese school that uh, I will talk about. Okay, now, moving to the next slide. Um, just about three sort of um, examples of uh, IR schools that I would like to very briefly touch on. The most important, well-known one is the English school. Um, it's also sometimes called International Society School. And uh, it was founded by people like Hadley Bull, who, by the way, was a visiting professor at the Indian School of International Studies. And uh, when he actually taught, I don't know for how long, but certainly he was there for uh, at least for probably a year or more. Uh, Adam Watson, uh, and currently Kim Don, and Andy Hurrell, Barry Buzan, uh, who I work with uh, quite a bit, and Richard Little, some of the names. Now, uh, this is interesting because it's a theory, but it kind of, to me, reflected a nostalgia about European dominance, that Europe is no longer ruling the waves, but European ideas, European uh, notions of uh, international relations have spread globally. So that is why I mean, the first book of this school was uh, edited by Hadley Bull and Adam Watson called Expansion of International Society. Well, where did the international society started? In Europe. So it's the European society that became the international society, a global society. And uh, today's uh, global society, their view was the European international society writ large. So there was kind of a bit of a nostalgia and Eurocentrism in that school, which uh, has been corrected somewhat uh, by people like Barry, uh, Barry Bajan and Richard Little, uh, but uh, not quite uh, been able to overcome that original uh, sort of uh, 
in, you know, centuries ago. Uh, the Copenhagen School is uh, more recent. It uh, also involves Barry, uh, but also Oli Weimer, um, and it's our secretary of the theory. How uh, policymakers and academics securitize uh, a, a, what it could be normal politics. So whether it is um, our nationalism, whether it is climate change, uh, and of course, uh, security can happen also to security issues like terrorism, and how they uh, sort of uh, um, bring it to the national or uh, international attention by calling it as a security uh, threat, in the speech act, so to speak. And uh, that theory has become very, very popular, a little controversial, but I think very popular in um, throughout the world and uh, trying to uh, get a framework, give a framework for uh, uh, understanding how issues suddenly acquire national and international prominence, attract a lot of attention, whether it's drug trafficking or a people's movement uh, or uh, terrorism, climate change. And uh, through this, uh, policymakers try to define and address that issue. And it's controversial because security reason can also have uh, some uh, harmful or negative consequences uh, over securitization. That means people forget the roots of the deep root causes of uh, issues like terrorism or uh, refugee flows and the like. And then more, more recently even, Chinese school. This has uh, really caught a lot of attention um, and it is uh, basically uh, the work of a few scholars. This is a school that hasn't really got critical mass even within China, but it suddenly uh, has uh, international recognition increasingly now. Um, which is a bit ironic because a lot of people in China, scholars in China, don't identify with the Chinese school. Um, but uh, internationally, it becomes a point of reference and debate in uh, criticizing the Chinese approach to IR. Now, I have been very familiar with this. I spent a year in China on sabbatical, and I know the big protagonists of this. Uh, Chin, Chin Yan Chin, for example, uh, former president of Chinese Foreign Affairs University. So it is the broader application of Chinese history and culture as it relates to IR, and you know this, uh, some of these concepts, like Tian Xia, uh, All Under Heaven, or Zhong Yang, the dialectics of uh, in Chinese uh, uh, yin and yang, for example. And uh, it's related to constructivism. Qin, in particular, is a constructivist, started as a constructivist, very much like myself, and uh, that's why I got to know him. Uh, but then later developed the Chinese school, and uh, I have uh, been dealing with him quite a lot uh, when Barry uh, Buzan and I did this non western IR theory in 2004, uh, he was one of the uh, people, he's the only person from China we invited to this conference. And um, as we invited Kanti uh, and Kanti Basfai. And uh, I think uh, he's a constructivist who, uh, who wanted to borrow Chinese idea, Chinese culture, uh, and project it through the constructivist lens, but call it the Chinese school. And that's nothing unusual. Uh, I'm sure the people in other countries, including in India, are trying to do that. But uh, is this school that's a problem, really. It hasn't traveled very much outside in terms of <laughs> attracting a critical, it has got a name recognition, but it hasn't really been applied to explain current problems of world politics, and including in China, including in the same city of Beijing, capital city, there is a Tsinghua school, uh, which uh, was developed by uh, Yan Shui Tong. Uh, and uh, he calls it moral realism because uh, uh, when Xin Yaxin uses constructivism to frame Chinese uh, classical ideas, uh, Yan Shui Tan uses uh, basically classical realism, IR realism, to project uh, pre Qin dynasty international thought. Um, but again, that hasn't really gone uh, very much outside of China. And there is one accusation, uh, a criticism, which I don't 100% agree. But uh, certainly, it is something to think about uh, that uh, it doesn't really explain the world politics as a whole. In fact, I have been challenging them to do that uh, for the last at least uh, seven, eight years. That you should not really have a theory that it has a, applies to China, explains Chinese, whatever, peaceful rise, or whatever you want to call it. Um, but it should really uh, also tell us something about world politics, what's happening in, in the world at large. And uh, they've been trying to do that recently, but not that much success as a school will demand. And I wouldn't want to go to Kyoto School and Frankfurt School. Uh, these are not really uh, purely IR uh, schools. Uh, they started uh, as a domestic politics, philosophy, uh, or politics in general. But they have been applied to 
uh, theories, uh, Friedman Hahn relations, Frankfurt School in particular is a foundation of what we call critical theory. Okay, moving on, I just want to uh, say is that if you want to know about the beginnings of Indian IR, read this person, Benai Sarkar. Now, he was writing in 1916, uh, and uh, in fact, he did a, uh, uh, did a book on uh, how to understand China from Indian uh, perspective. And remember, this is also a time when India and China uh, were both uh, championing uh, pan-Asianism, Rabindranath Tagore um, being an early pioneer of this, and there was no sort of tense of competition uh, in that sense. And he was trying to understand uh, what uh, uh, China looked like from what he called Hindu eyes. And I have a copy of the book in my, my desk here, uh, but uh, I think it's very fascinating uh, where he talked about uh, uh, some Indian uh, pan-Asiatic elements were coming from India. Uh, and uh, I think that is genuinely, genuinely uh, IR. Uh, but the most important piece is his Hindu theory of international relations in American political science review. It uh, was a little easier to publish in APSR those days than now, but still thinking about someone publishing in American political science review is, is astounding. And this was uh, in 1919, 19, sorry. Uh, the same year, the first chair of international politics ever, anyway, was founded at the University of Wales, Aberystwyth. So people say that uh, the founding of IR uh, started with, as uh, a discipline, started with uh, the founding of the Woodrow Wilson chair at the University of Wales in Aberystwyth, uh, what is now called Aberystwyth University, uh, which uh, in 1919. Uh, but that same year, uh, this uh, scholar, Binay Sarkar, published an article uh, uh, in uh, APSR. So um, if you look at it very carefully, uh, you'll see that uh, uh, it is very theoretical. And then he published another article in 2021 in Political Science Quarterly, which is a very significant journal in political science. So I read this. We'll move on to uh, various other uh, examples uh, in the next following slides. Uh, I don't want to go into it. Please move on. Uh, I want to make a point that plural um, now, very important. Sometimes people think of schools. Schools means you are focusing or you are agreeing that there's a consensus on one particular approach. And that is a problem with the school. Um, it doesn't fit in. Um, creating a school sometimes conflicts with the plurality of thought, and including, by the way, in China. Uh, and some, many of the Chinese are very realist. Uh, some of them are still Marxists. So they don't buy this idea of dividing Chinese uh, culture and ideas uh, to uh, to develop a Chinese school. So maybe it is uh, the Beijing school or part of the Beijing school rather than the Chinese school. Uh, and in India also, the same problem. In Indian uh, uh, international thought, the classical sources of international thought is so pluralistic. There is uh, idealism, I'm mean, using modern terms to basically doesn't do probably justice to what uh, classical thinking was about. But suddenly, if you apply some modern labels, you look at uh, 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 Indian classical, sources of classical Indian thought, the King Asokas, uh, Emperor Asokas, Kalinga Edi, talks about uh, uh, what is the intention of the king towards the unconquered territory. This is the territories between uh, Magadha and uh, Pataliputra and Kalinga. There were a bunch of uh, areas which are not conquered by anyone. Uh, and uh, he says, I'm not going to conquer you. Uh, but I'm going to uh, give you happiness. But then you have the very ultra-realist uh, Maschanaya, which is saying that uh, now the big piece is not small piece, a smaller piece and smaller piece is the smallest piece. And uh, that's found in many Indian texts, uh, including Mahabharata, the Sastra, and Manu, Sanita. And uh, then this idea of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, which uh, a lot of people are projecting from the government. You know, it is actually a very realist doctrine. Uh, please uh, go and read it. It's, a, it's how to, uh, it's, it's very deceptive. It says the whole world is a family, uh, and it's from the Mahapanisha. And I was very intrigued by it a few years ago. Uh, but I, I think it's a way of the jackal, um, basically, to pursue it, uh, the idea that don't worry, the world is a family, so I'm not going to harm you. But ultimately, uh, basically, uh, kills uh, the deer. So it's actually a very good example of. Uh, real thinking in classical idealistic uh, vocabulary. Uh, so please uh, look at this. It's uh, not what it uh, seems to be 
in public discourse. Moving on, uh, I don't want to go into this, but I want to say Kautili and Ashoka are not that different from each other when it comes to uh, humanism. Both of them actually, uh, and this is where I come to syncretism, uh, that are seemingly opposite types of thoughts could actually get together uh, and uh, have some common element, shared element. So you can find that in Kautili, uh, sorry, uh, in Ashoka, of course, it's very idealistic, religious tolerance uh, and uh, pluralism, a very, very important uh, foundation of his thinking, uh, dharma, but uh, Kautila is not ultra realist as uh, it's projected to be uh, these days, um, because he also talks about, uh, 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 he talks about uh, uh, religion prisoners, honoring all deities, when, it, when the conqueror conquers a new territory, should not really uh, destroy the religious pre existing religious or cultural foundations and also uh, even release prisoners. And why? Because the motivations are very different here. Uh, because Kautilya says if you don't do that, you will face a rebellion, uh, a, re a revolt sooner or later. So, this is a way to pacify. Kautilya is a pragmatic realist. Um, Ashok, on the other hand, uh, an idealist, but he did not really. Release Kalinga after conquering Kalinga and uh, you know preaching his dharma, developing. He didn't give liberation to Kalinga. Kalinga was liberated by uh, another dynasty much later after the fall of the Maurya dynasty, or uh, after the fall of Ashoka. So there is actually a, a tendency to combine realism and idealism in Indian thought, and nobody is a pure realist. Nobody is a pure idealist. Uh, moving on to a few other uh, slides, my last. Points. Can we go to the uh, next slide? Uh, moving on now, uh, beyond that, uh, again, syncretic Indian uh, is uh, very important uh, because uh, there are some Indian uh, classical thinkers or nationalist thinkers who think Indians are very different from the rest of the world, very unique, we are uh, sort of uh, distinctive exceptionalism. So, and this is not common, the Chinese said they are exceptional. Uh, Americans exceptionalism very well uh, established tradition, but you also find that uh, there's a lot of syncretism, East West synergy. Uh, Radha Krishna, who was uh, writing, can be also be a source of uh, higher thinking. So Asians are Pacific right tradition and temperament, but could supply the complement and complement uh, to Western rationalism. Nehru did the same thing. Uh, you will find that in the, uh, also epistemology. Uh, in, uh, in Bhagavad Gita, this is a line that I'm very fond of uh, because uh, this is the first time I actually, uh, we used to come up passages of Gita uh, in school. I studied Sanskrit in, in my high school, but I could never understood what it meant uh, until uh, in 2011 when I gave a lecture at LSC. And uh, we'll find some uh, examples of what are the different motivations behind war. And uh, in, in, in the Gita, you'll find uh, to me at least, five different um, motivations that Krishna uh, tells Arjuna about. Uh, that Arjuna decides he doesn't want to fight. He pauses before wading into the Mahabharata, the battle. He says, I'm going to kill my own relatives. I don't want to fight. Krishna says, why, why do you still fight? So one is that your cause is just because your family had been cheated uh, in a gambling uh, context. So you, you have a just cause. That's the reason for war. Uh, you don't, so you could, the second reason, if you don't fight your enemies, if your enemies will think you are a coward, uh, you lose your credibility and they will uh, come and conquer you anyway. So you should fight because of that. The third reason is that you will achieve personal honor and status. Honor is a very important reason for fighting um, in Greek, uh, Greek civilization and every civilization. Uh, if you fight and win, you'll get sovereignty and territory. So you'll become a conqueror. So that is the material uh, motive. And finally, um, why worry about killing your relatives? Because nobody dies anyway. The soul always goes to, uh, is immortal. Now, if you look at this, there is a rational element. There are rational uh, reasons why go to uh, uh, battle. But there is also this other worldliness. Uh, like, soul is immortal. I don't know. There is just a real soul out there. Uh, but uh, certainly, uh, you know, there may be. Uh, but uh, it is not really the same and the same class of explanation as saying uh, you call it just, which is a moral explanation or a material explanation that we get, we get territory. So, uh, so what Indian uh, thought is doing here is explaining uh, war in terms of uh, multiple factors uh, in, in a very syncretic way. Okay, so now I'm moving to the last slide, and uh, that will be 
one more. No, I will do it though. Uh, we don't have uh, time to cover this. You'll find this all in Gita and uh, San Sankhya philosophy. But global IR is actually a good way to capture a lot of Indian thinking uh, on IR, uh, both classical and modern. And there's a lot more into global IR than I can talk about. But let me just show you one more uh, slide that sums it up. Could you move to the, yeah, this is the one that I would like to talk about. Um, global IR redefines and broadens the discipline of IR by recognizing the histories, ideas, practices, and contributions of societies and actors that have been neglected and marginalized. And in 2014, uh, in, uh, uh, when I became the president of ISA in Toronto, I uh, uh, outlined this global IR. But really, um, if you look at some of my writings, the foundation of global IR, and I even the term global IR, was in my 2013 December speech at JNU. Uh, so I actually wrote a uh, article on this, uh, which you can see, uh, it was it's in the Observer Research Foundation website, um, a global, imagining a global IR out of India. That was my keynote speech, JNU, in December 3rd, 3rd, uh, 2013. And I developed it to, uh, did that into my ISA presidential speech. Uh, so uh, I think that I've, I have a lot of writings, but one thing uh, on the global IR, the one thing I would like to, uh, two things I'd like to uh, highlight. It's pluralistic universalism. There is no single idea that applies to all, single uh, mode of thinking that applies to all, unlike what the Enlightenment thinkers used to say, that there is a European rationalism, and if you don't fit in, uh, you're basically not rational, you're not civilized, and you're deserving to colonize. Now, the pluralistic universalism opposes the monistic universalism of the Enlightenment. So there are multiple ways of thinking, multiple ways of uh, conceptualizing reality, and you should um, really not uh, uh, think one size fits all and impose it on others. Uh, and that's what, the, but you can find that, uh, common ground among diversity. Diversity uh, doesn't mean there is no common ground. And finding that common ground among diverse elements by recognizing and respecting diversity first, then trying to find uh, common ground is what Global IR is about. Uh, and then I want to move on again, uh, looking at world history, uh, European history, I look at the multiple uh, points of origin of IR, and uh, not just from, now IR as a practice came from many, many different sources. The first chair might have been established in the uh, UK, uh, uh, but uh, we had a, you know, article coming out in APSR from India at that time. They were thinking from Latin American scholars. Uh, at that time, we have written, Barry and I have written about this in uh, making of global IR. The multiple global sources of IR is really what uh, we need to look at. And, uh, don't ignore area studies. Uh, the Indian School of International Studies is a classic example of how IR rode on the back of area studies. And we still have area study departments which coexist with uh, the Department of International Politics, where Gordon is teaching. Uh, so, so that's basically what IR in the United States, instead of shunt aside area studies as something inferior, uh, uh, something different. But area studies was always the foundation of IR. In fact, the IR in uh, it, it, the West is kind of a Western area studies. IR in the United States, not as an American area studies, because it's all about a lot about American foreign policy. And uh, multiple forms of agency, uh, not only material, fighting and winning wars, uh, acquiring a lot of wealth, but also resistance, revolution, creation, and uh, ideational um, the agency to norms, not alignment being one of them. Uh, that's also important rather than studying material agency. And finally, uh, subsuming rather than displacing uh, existing IR. This is a controversial element of global IR because you don't want to start, uh, you know, uh, reboot the discipline. Uh, I think that a lot of IR, existing IR is still valuable, including realism uh, and liberalism. Uh, it's not practical or necessary to say we want to sort of get rid of all of this and start afresh. Uh, because that will not do justice to including people in India, because a lot of Indian scholars are realists. Uh, so if you say that global IR doesn't have anything to do with realism, then you are also practicing the same kind of parochialism uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, we accuse the Western scholars of being. And uh, similarly, post-colonialism should not be uh, rejected but observed. Post-colonialism is very helpful to global IR. So this is a controversial argument. Some scholars, critical theories don't like it, think it's a bit conservative, but I think it's more inclusive rather than conservative. Okay, so let me just stop uh, to 
this is the very very last slide which uh, I will uh, go to so, uh, reading list. I don't know that you can find, but the, most of what I'm saying comes from a bunch of uh, writings I did in the last few years, uh, especially going back to the presidential address in 2014, but also the article in uh, Observer or online, which is basically my keynote speech to the 2013 conference in January. Uh, but thank you very much. I look forward to hearing from uh, discussions. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for that, uh, Professor Acharya, and uh, I think some some very rich content for all of us to dwell on. Uh, move immediately to the first of our discussions and uh, request uh, Dr. Atul Mishra to take over at this point. So, in the spirit of keeping to the format, I would like to respond to four um, aspects of uh, Professor Acharya's presentation, and. Uh, the reason I want to focus on them is because Professor Acharya has said that one way in which we can think about um, developing Indian thinking on international relations or an Indian school of international relations is by framing it within uh, global IR terms. So I think that um, because I've followed Professor Acharya's work over the past 20 years, including his pre global IR uh, period work on constructivism, norm research, and so on. Um, and I have followed over the past roughly 10 years now uh, the development of his thinking on uh, global IR, including uh, subsequently the kind of scholarship that has emerged uh, from our scholar, from our colleagues, such as Professor Navita Behera, as well as uh, Dr. Deep Shikha Shahi. Uh, uh, so with your permission, Chair, I wanted to uh, jump right into four um, key aspects of uh, the global IR idea that I uh, will arrive at with a degree of, uh, of, of skepticism. Um, and all of this, of course, in the spirit of uh, uh, carrying the conversation forward, because I think all of us are interested in consolidating um, and, and building upon existing real enduring gains in, uh, in our discipline. Now, the first one is about uh, the concept of pluralistic universalism, which is, I think, at the heart, one of the core pillars of, uh, of global IR. Uh, my first point there is that I'm unsure if IR's subject matter itself admits of any form of universalism. Now, if you think of the international as a domain that is characterized by a multiplicity of societies that do not recognize a higher authority, uh, then this domain invalidates any universalism at point zero. Uh, but since the concept is with us, the concept of pluralistic universalism is with us, let us try and engage it. Uh, now, from Professor Acharya's writings, there are two parts to it. One is that, uh, that, that uh, the notion says that there is no one idea or theory that fits all. Um, a, a variant on this scheme is that not no idea is applicable to all. Now, if by universalism is meant a claim that an idea or a theory is applicable to all, then so long as it remains a claim and not a fiat, an argument and not a decree, I do not see a fundamental problem with it. Put in the form of a question, why shouldn't we entertain the possibility that since humanity is one, there could be ideas that, regardless of where they are articulated from, are applicable to all. So this is just a provocation for all of us to think about. The second element of the pluralistic, pluralistic um, uh, universalism is the idea that recognition and that, that one must recognize and respect the diversity within the IR discipline. Now, recognition of and respect for diversity seems to me like a political objective befitting the multicultural variant of liberalism as a political theory rather than something that scholarship should aim to do. I recognize that knowledge production is never innocent of political considerations, but should knowledge production have for its goal the execution of a political objective, no matter how lofty and desirable? Now, in response, therefore, I would propose that if we think of something like a, plural a plurality of universalisms, then we might be able to make some headway here. Let us have a situation where multiple claims of universally applicable ideas about international affairs compete for the attention of states, societies, cultures, or any other international actor. So this, insofar as the first major uh, element of global IR. The second element uh, concerns loosely around 
the claim that, uh, that, that, that there is in some ways IR contains, um, that, that there is some kind of a Western monopoly over the international. And it comes, uh, to me, it comes through in uh, a, a, a sentence uh, from Professor Acharya's presentation, which is that the substance of IR was not invented in the West, nor did it begin with the peace of Westphalia in 1648. And I agree. Uh, the way I'd like to think about the question is whether the ontology of the international has been claimed to be Western in origin. There are only two ontologies of the international, which are possible, at least to my mind. The negative one, which is based on anarchy, the, uh, you know, the international domain is characterized by the absence of something which is uh, a sovereign authority. And the positive one, which is that the international domain actually generates from the presence and interaction of uh, a multiplicity of societies. Now, both these conditions have obtained across space and time in human affairs as far back as historical records can take us. And I'm yet to come across one serious work of international relations, including any work of IR theory that has emerged from the West, that has actually argued that the ontology of the international is Western in origin. I'm not familiar with such a claim being even implied in any serious work emerging from the West either. Now, the second part, as for the, as for the piece of Westphalia, I think all of us agree that it refers to the origin of the modern system of states, which is only one way in which international relations express themselves. And this system has become global. For better or worse, we can debate it, but it has become global. But I'm not sure if any serious scholar who say, I'm not familiar with any serious scholar who says that the Westphalian system is the only institutional elaboration of international relations amongst territorially organized political societies, which in our times tend to be uh, the sovereign state, as is the case, uh, as has always been the case. The sovereign state has always had its competitors. Now, therefore, I think the question that we might, we should really be asking is whether, is what specific forms have transboundary, interactive, and systemic phenomena, which are three generic expressions of the international, taken across space and time. The third concept is the concept of the global in global IR. Uh, the global across the disciplines remains a slippery term, and it remains to, me, to my mind in, uh, in, in global IR as well. Uh, I would want to understand what holds this concept together. What is the ground on which the global stands if it is not non-Western by another name? I can understand American, European, Western history as also Indian, Chinese, Islamic, African, South African, Japanese, or Bangladeshi history. But I struggle to make sense of global history unless it is a history of a systemic phenomenon like the Cold War or capitalism, or of an idea that has circulated across a majority of the continents of the world, or of a development such as the creation of Bangladesh as told by Shina Chadman, that was intricately, intricately tied to the global dynamics of the Cold War. The problem becomes, the problem of the global becomes particularly acute when one seeks to build a theory. And we can't build a theory if we don't have a normative foundation. So what concrete political values should underpin any theory building exercise within global IR? Chinese, Indian, Islamic, African, South American, Japanese. One cue is possibly provided by the, the concept of pluralistic universalism. And one possibility is to suggest that recognition and respect for diversity of thought and experience that populate and punctuate international life is in itself a political value, and surely it is. And on that basis, we could in fact mount a global normative theory, and surely we can. But why build a case for uh, what is patently obvious, which is to say, in today's world, do we have anyone who seriously contests the idea that diversity needs both recognition and respect? And my final point, uh, is that we need to pay a little more attention and more careful attention to the utility of global IR for stakeholders that go beyond people who actually uh, push forward the agenda, the disciplinary agenda of global IR. Now, on the assumption that its practitioners want to see its academic fortunes rise with more funding, conferences, research and publications, global IR could set for itself the task of basically answering two difficult questions. One, which questions of the real world that have a direct bearing not on IR as a discipline, but on the international as a dimension of social reality can be addressed by global IR? And 
Can protocols of answering these questions and the answers reached compete with existing schools, paradigms, traditions, or theories? That's the first difficult question, I think. Put in, 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 in more practical everyday terms, how can, for instance, doctoral school scholars use global IR to de describe, explain, and understand the real world? The second important question, I think, is can global IR become analytically illuminating for the layperson who is interested in actual international relations? Uh, these, both these questions, I think, are important because if IR is a social science, then its global variant must address itself to real-world international affairs, to their transformation, yes, but only after their explanation and understanding. Uh, Chair, I thank you for, uh, for giving me this opportunity, as also to the uh, Symbiosis School of uh, International Studies. I'm sorry I couldn't be uh, there in person because of personal pressing circumstances, but I've, uh, I've, glad, I've been very glad to be invited and have benefited uh, from uh, Professor Acharya's presentation. And I look forward to your comments. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Mishra. I don't know whether you can hear the applause in the auditorium, but let me transmit that to you as well. Uh, and thanks so much to both uh, Professor Acharya and to Dr. Mishra for staying so, so carefully to the time allotted. We'll now turn this over to Professor Siddharth Malbaraki. OK. At the outset, my gratitude to the co-hosts of the conference, uh, the Policy Planning and Research Division of the Ministry of External Affairs uh, and the Symbiosis School of International Studies for their warm invitation to participate in this conference and the hospitality during my stay here. It's wonderful to be deliberating over various facets of an Indian approach to international relations in these precincts. What I intend doing in the next few minutes is to offer a set of 10 propositions to mull over what it means to be thinking theoretically in our immediate context. Let me begin with the first proposition. Material power and standing appear to determine receptivity to ideas on the global stage. No more is this evident than in the case of theories of international relations. The provenance of theories has had very much to do with the configuration of power in international relations. 19th century Britain and 20th century post Second World War United States excise an undue influence on the concepts, categories, and maps of the world. The curiosity about China and in some parts India today has to do clearly with the recognition that these are powers that are going to matter increasingly in the years to come. However, as Octavio Paz, the Mexican Nobel laureate in literature, had argued several years ago that economic underdevelopment has really nothing to do with epistemic underdevelopment. This is an idea I'm glad to elaborate on later during the question and answer session. Proposition two, there is much that the disciplinary histories of international relations today reveal about various forms of effacement in the discipline. It is no accident that decolonization has received short shrift in accounts of political realism, that African-American contributions have been ignored in the story of the development of the American variant of the discipline of international relations, that imperialism as a category has fallen off the map in the post-Second World War, uh, world, when in fact international relations, according to some, uh, could be viewed as, quote, empire by other means, unquote. We also learn through revisionist histories that the three great debates which are often used to offer us an account of the intellectual development of the discipline are simplistic, reducing the world to neat categories of realism and idealism. For instance, in the first debate, when in fact the story appears to be a much more messier story in reality. What all of this amounts to is that we must not be surprised that a discipline characterized by strong Anglo-American accents has neglected ideas from other parts of the world, particularly from the global south, Asia, Africa, South America, and the Arab world. The third proposition. If we recognize that all of us, irrespective of our location in the world, require referential frameworks to navigate the world, then we must simultaneously recognize that there is no escape from theory. Theory is inevitable the moment we commit to an explanation of how the world works or how even smaller slices of reality can be best accounted for. John Mearsheimer and Sebastian Rosato in their recent book on how states think suggest that we are homo theoreticus, inevitably theoretical human beings. While we may disagree about their claims on rationality and state behavior, this is indeed true. As Sheldon Pollock has argued elsewhere, quote, 
At the most general level of analysis, all perception is admittedly theory-laden, as many sociologists and philosophers have explained. We cannot recognize the world around us without simultaneously fitting our cognitions, or pre-fitting or retrofitting them, whichever is a true sequence, into the linguistic and conceptual schemata that constitute our world. The formulation of empirical observations becomes possible only within some referential framework. Theory at so intimate a level is a very hard, is very hard indeed to resist, unquote. A fourth proposition. Since theories are human constructs, they reflect specific intellectual histories in their evolution. It is not surprising that a bunch of German emigres particularly left an imprint on the American discipline. Their view of, the hu their view of human nature was not going to be benign as they were fleeing Nazi persecution and making a home in the new world. This has, however, become a static and arresting Hobbesian account of world politics. Robert, Cox, Robert Cox presently argued that, quote, theory is always for someone and some purpose, unquote. Located as we are in the global south, we need to ask theory by whom and theory for whom. What slice of reality does it explain? And is the account plausible and fulfilling in terms of the intellectual mandate it set out, sets out to accomplish? There has for a long time been a peculiar anxiety for the scholar in the global south to apply a framework developed elsewhere to explain our empirics and feel that the lack of fit is a failure on the part of the researcher. However, the lack of fit, I would argue, is an opportunity to theorize afresh, unencumbered by a grand theory explanation that no longer seems to hold true for all times and places. A fifth proposition, good theory requires good empirics. What this means is that as scholars located where we are, we need to pay closer attention to our own empirical realities. Rajamon made this case persuasively yesterday in regard to the paucity of work on borderlands. Can we discern a broader set of patterns that explain these liminal spaces in theoretical, in theoretical terms to a global audience? I believe this is possible, but we must be patient and commit to systematic inquiry before we rush to generalize. At an age in time when grand theory is itself in retreat in some forms, it's perhaps wise to focus on middle range theorizing. What this entails is identifying particular slices of reality and focusing on explaining them rather than seeking to explain everything in the world. I also feel that we do not need to establish that we have our own realists, liberals and constructivists and all other shades of critical theory. Perhaps we do have all of them, but these are labels at the end of the day, and labels that slot complex thinkers like Cautilia and several others in one or, the, one or two boxes. If there's anything we can learn from the revisionist accounts of figures in the history of international relations, it is that scholars were wrong to reduce these figures to any one simple school of thought. They often straddled many worlds, and pigeoning, pigeonholing them into this or that slot does a severe injustice to the complexity of their thought and personas. A sixth proposition. There is a rich tradition of thought in the social sciences that establishes that context matters when it comes to knowledge creation. Theory is no different. While there is a quest for first order principles, what we must not forget is that they make sense under certain political conditions. A good source to turn, in this, turn to in this regard is the opening volume of the Oxford Handbooks of Political Science edited by Robert Gooden and Charles Tilley, and titled The Oxford Handbook of Contextual Polit Political Analysis. In the introduction, the authors argue the following, quote, in response to each of the big questions of political science, we reply, it depends. Valid answers depend on context in which the political processes under study occur. Valid answers depend on understandings built into the questions with regard to the evidence available for answering these questions and with regard to the actual operation of political processes." Unquote. I think this understanding is important uh, if we are to factor in context in a more serious way when it comes to embarking on theorizing the world from an Indian provenance. A seventh pro a proposition. There's often a tension between what we may treat as provincial and what we may treat as universal. What the history of Eurocentrism has revealed through the works of historians like Deepesh Chakrabarti and others is that the provincial is often masqueraded as the universal. His book, Provincializing Europe, makes this argument in a compelling fashion. This argument warrants a moment of critical pause as we sift through in our own setting 
ideas that are more context specific and those that appear to have a much wider generic purchase. While everyone wants a slice of the universal, and while as Indians we can actively participate in thinking about these questions, we need to be circumspect in terms of what we think is likely to be a value in a larger global conversation. Surely an ancient civilization like India must have given thought with some degree of sophistication to questions of political rule and obligation, justice, order and legitimacy, to name just a few vital arenas. However, we must also recognize what Terry Nardin, the political theorist, once argued. He suggested that different traditions may also ask different questions. It is in this idiom that some of the more original work from the global south is likely to emerge in the years to come. Our questions need not mim mimic the cookie cutter template set of concerns, which conventional theories of international relations often treat as axiomatic. An eighth proposition. I would like to suggest that we must be wary of any one quintessential theory of international relations that we may treat as Indian. What is more worthwhile is to explore the world as viewed from our location with all our filters of history, geography, culture, and an acute recognition of the peculiar conjunction and circumstances that result in particular trajectories of political, social, and economic consolidation. While we need to be wary of facile application of theory shaped elsewhere in the Indian context, we perhaps also need to give ample thought to the academic rigor that should accompany any such exercise. Here, it's important to distinguish between thought, practice, and theory. While thought is extremely useful to assemble and study with care, it does not by itself auto automatically amount to being viewed as theory. From thought can be distilled ideas that are particularly valuable to discern patterns that amount to an explanation or deepen our understanding of a particular phenomenon. There is much scope for this evaluation in the Indian setting. An excellent body of work is shaping up in the thought realm. Kanti Bajpai, my own mentor, has long been invested in this process and has produced some wonderful scholarship in this regard. Rahul Sagar has done an excellent job of assembling a remarkable inventory of thinkers in our not too distant past, who have all added to our understanding of the category of the international. This is a remarkably important move at this juncture of scholarship. While there is greater receptivity from the world outside to India, in ideas from this part of the world, the onus is on us to deliver these alternative almanacs of dates, texts, figures that complicate our understanding of the world and make a claim on the global in ways which for various reasons have hitherto not been sufficiently explored. A ninth proposition. An idea worth exploring in this regard is the notion of transculturation. Walter Mignolo squarely addressed the issue of transculturation. He argued, quote, theories travel and when they get places, they are transformed, transcultured. He further clarifies, quote, if indeed theories travel and get transcultured, it is necessary first to specify historically from where they depart and where they go, how they travel, how they get transcultured, and the language in which traveling theories are fabricated, packaged, and transcultured." Unquote. These questions are important for any discipline to address, and particularly for a discipline like international relations that takes upon itself the task of constructing systemic theories. The temptation for universal claims is probably stronger in international relations than in other disciplines, given the very nature of the subject matter. While thinking about ideas that emerge from other contexts, we need to discern if there's something of value or if something needs to be rejected. We must be careful not to throw the baby with the bathwater in some instances. Combating one form of European ethnocentrism with another form of ethnocentrism from within will not do the knowledge enterprise any good. What we might require is a deeper appreciation of interconnections while disentangling various legacies and identifying lineages of ideas that we might genuinely take credit for. This will require the precision of a forensic to distill and extract slices of knowledge that are particularly of value from the perspective of a global conversation today on all key questions that animate the discipline of international relations. War and peace, international institutional design, economic inequities, gridlocks in global governance, a planetary consciousness with regard to ecolo ecological issues, the list is long. A final proposition. 
I now examine the question of identity and culture. It is safe to assume that identities are not fixed or static configurations, but are subject to elements of constant renegotiation. There are two dimensions that constitute identity formation that the philosopher J. Mohanty distinguishes between. The first refers to identity derived from one's cultural context. The second refers to a formal identity which remains generic and is not specific to any one culture. Both these notions of identity are linked to the idea of personhood. They remain integral to arriving at a fuller sense of both re issues relating to ontology and epistemology. Mohanty concedes, quote, that there may be a subtle conceptual link between the ontological question, what sort of identity characterizes a person, and the epistemological question, how do we come to ascertain such an identity, unquote. However, while my identity is shaped by my cultural experience, it does not limit the possibility of my retaining a critical stance vis-a-vis -vis my own culture. This ability to retain this perspective on one's own identity is treated akin to the idea of a transcendental ego. That's the term Mohanty uses in his frame. And this is what he argues in this context. Quote, my identity is not exhausted by my social self. I'm not a mere point of intersection of innumerable social relationships. I can, in a reflective stance, reduce myself to the life of an ego, to the stream of my inner mental life, but more than that, I can also critically reflect on the social origin of my beliefs and interpretations which involve a certain distancing, a certain refusal to submerge myself, to use a philosophical jargon, a transcendental ego. My contention is that a person has essentially the possibility of adopting the stance of a transcendental ego." Unquote. Thus, it is important to distill both elements of one's identity layers which are steeped in one's culture and aspects of self that successfully retain a certain distancing from the interiority of a particular culture. Let me examine both these strands of identity in greater detail in the context of India. At the outset, one must guard against any simple notion of an essential identity. This is likely to be a chimera. However, this does not preclude the possibility that there are certain dominant predispositions present within different cultures. Let me illustrate this through the claims advanced by the literary scholar A.K. Ramanujam in an interesting piece titled, Is There an Indian Way of Thinking? Ramanujam makes a fundamental distinction between context-sensitive rules and context-free rules, and argues that different cultures are likely to privilege one or the other of these dimensions when it comes to their daily social life. He goes on to argue that in the Indian setting, it is the context-sensitive kind of rule interpretation that provides us with the necessary knowledge to make sense of society. And he observes specifically in this connection, quote, texts may be historically dateless, anonymous, but their contexts, uses, efficacies are explicit. The Ramayana and Mahabharata open with episodes that tell you why and under what circumstances they were composed. Every story is encased in a meta story. And within the text, one tale is the context for another within it. Not only does the outer frame motivate the inner substory, the inner story illuminates the outer as well. It often acts as a microcosmic replica for the whole text." Unquote. It is this kind of caution that perhaps needs to be exercised as we, approached, as we approach texts, these texts and their manner of interpretation. I concur with many of the propositions um, Amitabh Acharya, Prof. Amitabh Acharya has uh, uh, posed in this particular statement um, the need to avoid cultural, cultural exceptionalism, the fact that our sources of knowledge in India are syncretic and diverse. Uh, that theory is not uh, simply a reproduction of an official discourse. Uh, that theories need to travel, uh, that theories require that the idea of a school at some level might be a little formalistic and restricting. Uh, if it's not necessarily re representing a fairly coherent body of, a body of ideas. Uh, it might take some work uh, to think about a set of key tenets which might uh, constitute a school by itself. But at this stage, I think we have to build block by block, uh, which is to suggest that I think the move to historicize the international is an important move. Uh, and I think the idea of a global IR is an important and interesting idea and we need to still ask, what does the term global continue to occlude or neglect?
So in conclusion, uh, I think we need to tread with confidence, but also with care. The consolidation of our thought and the histor historicizing of the international are important moves towards theory building. Theory ultimately is not the monopoly of any civilization, even though it may have instantiated itself in that fashion in our recent history in the discipline of international relations. While we have today a better grasp of the lineages of our prior innocence in the world of theorizing, there is much hard work that needs to be done before we can participate more fully and fairly in a larger global conversation. It is a task that is well worth doing rather than turning our backs on theory. When asked what his hopes for the 21st century were, Chinua Achebe, the accomplished writer from Nigeria said, my hope for the 21st century is that it will see the first fruits of the balance of stories among the world's peoples. Theoretical scholarship requires a simil similar ambition and scholarship um, in India with, must with a, proceed with a quiet confidence that can aspire to step up to the plate. Thank you for your attention. Well, as uh, we can see, we've had uh, three uh, presentations that are staggeringly original. Uh, they, are, uh, they are extremely rich. Uh, they are, all three of them, complex but nuanced. And I think that itself, I think, is, is, is a really positive sign about sort of where sort of the scholarship is, even in that sort of very superficial generational sense that I laid out initially. Um, and amazingly, collectively, they've managed to do it uh, in just about two and a half minutes more than the time that was assigned to them, with the two of them sort of actually being online. So that's, that's, that's a wonderful achievement, and thank you so much for that. Uh, it leaves us, I suspect, with about uh, anything between 12 to 15 minutes for for sort of interaction, question and answers, uh, and, and the rest of it. So uh, we'll open it up. Uh, and uh, please identify yourself. Uh, and uh, while comments are welcome, please keep them short. Questions are preferred. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Kumar Aryan. I'm from SSIS. Sir, so my question is to uh, Professor Amitav Acharya, sir. Sir, as you emphasized uh, that the Indian school of IR like carries a bit of post-colonialism bias. So according to you, what are the structural changes that can be brought to overcome this challenge, sir? There is actually an Indian school of IR that is post-colonialism. Um, the number of Indian scholars, whether you talk about literary critics like uh, Guy Face, Spivak, Arjun Apadurai, which does modernization, uh, Indian uh, scholarship on IR, or IR scholarship influenced by Indians uh, is overwhelmingly post colonial. So it's not unfair to say that post colonialism and subaltern, uh, subaltern theory, which also has influence on IR. Um, is actually an Indian, uh, I would say Indian contribution to IR, not Indian school probably. So, so I don't want to actually avoid it. I, I welcome it. Uh, without post-colonialism, there will be no criticism of the mainstream um, sort of IR theories. And uh, let them have their say. So that's why global IR doesn't really uh, encourage one theory or uh, another, whether it's uh, realism or, or post-colonialism. It's inclusive. And uh, global IR itself is not a theory. It sort of encourages all theories to take into account what Siddharth said about context uh, and uh, glo uh, global history or world history. I, global IR always uses world history rather than global history. And, uh, and, uh, and also uh, the agency claims of different types of actors. So, so honestly, I think post-colonialism is welcome. And I uh, work with a lot of post-colonial scholars uh, even now, after my global IR term, so to speak. Thank you. Uh, next question. 
my name is rucha i am from manipal university my question is to uh, sit professor siddharth sir uh, so even in this discussion in, in the earlier discussions we uh, there was a reference to ancient indian lit literature like mahabharata or manusmriti and there we somehow connected it to um, how there was a thinking about national interest or survival so my question like more it's like a confusion uh, that for which i'm seeking your uh, clarification i'm would say that uh, isn't it like this way are we just attempting to validate uh, the realism theory which is ultimately a western theory instead of coming with something that is an original indian thought or a theory from the for the literature thank you okay thank you for that question um first of all i think um, there are two elements present here one i think when we approach the past and when we think about ideas from the past Uh, one of the uh, sort of efforts we often make is to see how does that relate to the present, um, and sometimes we're talking about really wide, um, you know, swaths of history. This is lo sometimes long dury history, even where we're thinking about you know several centuries before the current moment, and we're thinking about how certain residues of thought ideas have com continued to sort of inform uh, the manner in which we deal with the present. Uh, I think it's challenging sometimes to actually establish that link with some degree of clarity uh, in terms of how a particular idea lodges itself in terms of a, of a particular practice, and it requires careful work. Um, even if we do concede that there are these influences, which surely are at some deeper level and substratum, uh, maybe in our subconscious, even you know, informing the manner in which we think about the world. it would be interesting to see how we can establish that in concrete instances the other with regard to categories like realism liberalism and idea i think i find some of these categories rather limiting you know okay uh, walls was a realist mirsham was a realist but kautilya precedes him by centuries and why should we have the anxiety to sort of fit him into this or that model of realism immediately there is no such hurry and i think with revisionist histories what we've learned is that these figures are actually far more complex and interesting what we're doing is sometimes there's a reductionism in terms of saying x is a realist or x is a liberal or y is something else uh we're heaping these labels on them sometimes a little prematurely and good historical scholarship uh good scholarship which is willing to revisit these categories and the set of ideas which particular thinkers are associated with seem to suggest a more complex set of influences even in terms of how we can think of a particular figure uh and i think it's interesting even in more recent uh, work um you know even around contemporary figures uh sometimes there has been an effort to revisit them in terms of more complex legacies without necessarily you know pinning them with labels immediately thank you Uh, uh can i can i add something to that please. Uh, baron is yes please come in please come in uh thank you thank you baron uh, i actually thought much of what siddharth said uh right now and also before uh in his main presentation towards the end at least are very much uh, foundational to global ir so I, he should have given the keynote speech on me uh, i didn't come here to preach global ir i actually wanted to see what a indian school of ir might look like and uh and i think all these elements uh, siddharth mentioned are really very critical not uh, respecting theoretical boundaries and that's not very indian uh if you want to talk about indian school of ir indian uh, thought has always been eclectic syncretic but there is a tendency these days either uh, within india but how india is perceived indian ir thought is perceived outside that somehow uh, india is very, becoming very nationalistic and trying to revive kautilya revive the classical the indus valley civilization and that's what i was trying to warn against because even uh, we don't have any conclusive evidence of uh, of, of this or that uh, there is a uh, theory is about a discourse of indian school of ir if it was to come about so not privilege one discourse over another uh, because india has always been diverse that was really the central point of what i wanted to convey and also about global ir and i kind of, kind of uh, remarkably siddharth made all the sub similar points but also the other point i want to make it be theoretical you cannot really build an indian school of ir or any school of ir being theoretical so be theoretical but avoid being subnistic uh, exceptionalist or nationalistic uh and uh, that uh, that the key purpose of this and the much effort to that side actually fits into uh that my purpose of accepting this invitation thank you atul do you want to come in uh, particularly since you 
and usually one of one of the discussants in this conference actually discuss the presentation, uh, which uh, you know I thought I thought you raised some very interesting sort of uh, issues there. Uh, do you want to sort of uh, come in and perhaps uh, uh, you know engage on any specific point with uh, Professor Acharya at this point, uh, or, or or would you rather have sleeping dogs lie? Um, well, um, no, uh, Prasanni, I, I, I would want to respond to the, to add actually to what uh, Siddhartha and Prasad Acharya have said in response to the second question, if, uh, if you permit. Sure, please go ahead. Uh, so there are two parts. One is uh, the straightforward, this is something that all of us would warn uh, students against, this tendency to sort of back project current labels uh, to a particular period. Uh, what, what I think the way in which we should go about uh, genuinely thinking about the question of originality, can we discover originality in, um, in our traditions, is to actually identify what is it that we are looking for when we look at one of these texts. And therefore, come, you know, just, just, uh, just absolutely clear tools of examination Identifying what is it that we mean by the international is central. And to my mind, uh, there are not too many ways in which you can delineate and delimit the international. Once you've got that clarity, once you've figured out that this is what you're looking for in a particular text, then the question of label becomes irrelevant. Then the question is, this particular theorist, what kind of an international is, 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 uh, is uh, apparent or is it implicit in this particular theorist? So, for example, with regard to Cotillier, right? I mean, there is a lot of argument uh, that that Cotillier is a realist. To me, I've struggled to find a theory in in Cotillier's uh, uh, Arthashastra. What I do find, and I think it's it's spectacular, is a model of a strategic environment, right? But a model of a strategic environment is very different from a theory, which actually talks about um, about the origins of certain phenomena, patterns in international relations, and so on and so forth. So figuring out what is it that we are looking for, which is to say what kind of an international we are looking for in, in the first place, and then examining these texts, I think is one way to stumble onto or at least enhance the possibility of, of, of figuring out or discovering something that is both original and uh, enduring, and that also avoids a the trap the anachronism problem of of back projecting labels from contemporary period to the past but also cultural exceptionalism and so on and so forth so uh, that's the only thing that i wanted to uh, to, to say and respond to uh, thank you i think that was really indeed a very fascinating panel and i have actually a, a couple of questions uh, maybe uh, some uh, comments. But I think uh, the first question is, and uh, this is to any of the panelists, I feel they're all competent enough. Um, the first is that, you know, as, as an IR, as master's IR student, I often, we often read about Coxian dialectics. Then as time passed, we did study about Chinese dialectics too. And uh, 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 Amitabh Acharya was uh, talking about it. But when it really comes to Indian dialectics, I really don't see anything um, uh, being theorized essentially by uh, any of the IR theorists. Now this really comes, brings me, I think, to the second question of global IR. Now one of the main limitations which I really see in this debate on global uh, IR is really, again, I would say the limitation of IR theorists to really uh, discuss questions of meta theory primarily issues which relate to the philosophy of science debates in international relations. And that I think is, is one of the major limitations because if you do not really pay attention to that, then you would misread Cordelia because I think one of the meta-theoretical frameworks of the methodological foundations which is there in uh, Arthashastra is on Anvikshiki. So I think, uh, Indian dialectics is important, Indian ways of thinking is important, and I think the thought behind the theory becomes um, an important entry point for really taking this discussion further. My third 
question in specific is to the comment which Professor Acharya talked about post-colonialism. And of course here, I'm not really demeaning the post-colonial scholarship. I really do some, see some merit in that in terms of bringing the epistemic silences from the margins to the center. Uh, but I, when you really look at the methodological approaches with post-colonial scholarship praises or the uh, people who've really worked on post-colonial scholarship is primarily that of Derrida or Foucault, which is, I'm not saying that they're not really getting uh, of some, some, something uh, of, of value, but definitely there is also an element of subject positions, relativism, which is coming on, which of course is very important for a post-colonial uh, uh, society, so please do not misread me on that. But when it really again comes to and, and, and Siddharth, I think, was really talking about case, cases and, and going beyond grand theories. But I think one specific question in terms of where is really then the Indian thought and the contribution when it comes to the theories of international relations, and there is where I think I go back to this question of Indian dialectics, which is very important in terms of coming up, say, with some theorization when it comes to IR. India, thank you. So basically, I think uh, it's it's Indian dialectics, meta theory, and sort of you know in a way uh, you know the the, the whole sort of post coloniality uh, sort of you know significance. Uh, who'd like to take a crack at this first? Uh, so that, uh, sorry, uh, but when I can uh, since so, some of this was directed to me, and I now we're running out of time. So here here is what I want to sure. say probably in my last intervention. Um, in specific relation to the question uh, about taking into account Indian dialectics or uh, meta theory, uh, work is being done. Um, I would uh, recommend reading Dipsika Shahi's uh, theory uh, of talking about Advaita, for example. It's an epistemological contribution. It may not be dialectical, but it is epistemological. And uh, even uh, Navnita Behra also has uh, done work on this. Uh, in a, on a, from a different aspect. But I, I think the broader point is uh, post colonialism, by the way, is not just about Derrida or Foucault. That's post structural and the post critical theory. Post colonial scholars uh, actually look at uh, colonialism and they are more influenced by Gaffney Spivak and, uh, and the best uh, Chakravarti rather than uh, Foucault and uh, Derrida. Uh, and uh, they have limitations, but no, every theory has limitations. Um, but I think they are a very important contribution to moving IR uh, um, beyond uh, the, the traditional sort of uh, dominant sources of our real, our realism, liberalism, and constructivism. I'm talking about discipline. So, uh, so, so the, this is a very final point, uh, is that uh, there's a lot of writing on global IR, a lot of discourses, a lot of debates, what is global, uh, whether global IR pays attention to ontology or epistemology, uh, and this has been really growing discourse, but and, and probably one should take a look at them. Uh, this may not be the best place to debate those finer points uh, in debate. But here, this uh, particular meeting was about uh, an Indian school of IR. And, and that's what I'm uh, trying to focus on that. And I think global IR may be a possible way. I didn't say it is the only way. Uh, but uh, I think postal journalism may be another way. Feminism may be another way. Uh, but you uh, you can discuss levels for sure, but uh, you, if you want to relate to the global IR community, and we are talking about a school of IR, you have to also relate to their terms. Otherwise, it's a conversation past each other, not conversation engagement with each other. So you have to also use some of the vocabulary to reject that vocabulary. Uh, and, uh, and I think it is very important to uh, think about uh, what what, how can you build, if we need an Indian school of IR? I personally don't see the need for an Indian school of IR because it, uh, the idea of pluralism, syncretism, diversity uh, militates against imposing a particular school. But if you want to build a school of IR, uh, and, uh, and, and how do we do this? The single most important thing is use history. History, epistemology, all these things matter, uh, in the Mahabharata are very important, but not the only one. You can look at the nationalist thinkers, uh, uh, you know, whether it's Nehru or Tagore. A lot of people have done excellent work for, out of Tagore's uh, ideas. Uh, and uh, but whatever you do, but try to not make it like this is an Indian have a specific way of contributing. Uh, there's an Indian way of thinking. There is a, uh, and that way is maybe the Hindu way of thinking. 
uh, one of the things about Binay Sarkar's Arjuna article is focusing too much on Hinduism and not on other Indian traditions. Uh, so by all means, study history, but don't make it exceptional and serve the end of politics. And that was basically what I wanted to say. Uh, that was the only reason, really, I accepted this invitation. And I wanted to go there, but uh, I really uh, wanted to do this online. Thank you for that. Uh, I think, uh, Siddharth, would you like to, 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 yeah? Yeah, thanks, thanks for that question, Mida. But just a couple of quick thoughts. One, of course, I think we need to be careful about what we treat as theory, uh, in this case, again, uh, as in every other instance. I think as long as it's sort of an explanatory framework, it discerns certain broader patterns, explains the relationship between two or three important elements which we want to study, um, it's useful. So there's no harm trying to tease out uh, theoretical propositions from a text like Kautilya's Arthashastra. And if you do it well, uh, you know, it is going to be viewed as important in that sense. And it can participate in a much larger conversation around all those questions which interest us, for strategy, uh, you know, anything you want to think about, uh, allies and adversaries and things like that. Uh, the other, of course, you mentioned post-colonial scholarship and it's okay if there are other influences sometimes in the world of ideas. Uh, if it weren't for Michel Foucault's work on power knowledge, uh, we would be somewhat impoverished, I think. Uh, if it wasn't for Derrida's close reading of texts, uh, we wouldn't learn about a particular strategy of how to read texts more closely. So I think we should be confident about taking on other bodies of knowledge while being critically sort of anchored in our own context and setting. Um, and I think that, that would do us good more than any other strategy. I want to quickly mention the two questions you had initially posed, and I concur with you about no theory, no school as well as about uh, the inadequate theorization of non-alignment. Uh, I think you're where best placed to answer the global question because of, I've always admired a comparative Latin Americanist deep understanding in your uh, work and makeup. So, uh, but as a chair, I think you were constrained today. <laughs> um, so uh, I was supposed to sum this up uh, and I know you're all getting very impatient. It always happens. This is technical session six. Uh, the minister isn't here. It's deeply academic, so I know you all would rather be elsewhere, but uh, please keep yourself in this geography for just a little while longer. Um, so summing up quite simply, it's quite clear we've, we've got sort of three of the best minds in the business, and they're, I think we're all sort of saying that we have a clear idea of what uh, a, you know, a school of, an Indian school of international relations should not be. Uh, and I think that's important. You know, uh, I think I think we are still not quite certain about what a future Indian School of International Relations would contain. But I think th just the fact that we are placing out all of these cautionary notes about what the paths not to tread, I think is intellectually hugely important. And I don't think we should see that in any way uh, as a waste of time. My sense is given where we are located in world history, uh, any new school uh, of international relations will have to theoretically really seriously problematize sovereign territoriality uh, and you know uh, how you would go about doing that uh, I think uh, is a challenge and maybe there's a uniquely Indian way of doing that maybe there isn't uh, but but you know uh, if you're actually going to meet some of the criteria that Professor Acharya laid down for us about what a new school must necessarily consist of in order to be considered a school I think somewhere problematizing sovereign ter territoriality, uh, you know, will sort of I think I think I think come in, and I, also I, I suppose bringing in ideas, you know, uh, such as for instance the Gandhian idea of trusteeship, uh, you know, uh, and seeing whether we can apply an idea like trusteeship, uh, you know, in the kind of uh, you know really imperiled planetary times that we live in. Uh, you know, may again sort of be an interesting challenge, but whether even that could be a seminal idea around which an entire school could be built uh, is I think something that I would myself, I think be quite skeptical of. Uh, the organizers in the wings have been glaring at me for some time. So uh, I'll continue to be charming and not glare back at you, but we'll bring this to a close now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. We have been charmed by this session. Uh, so thank you, Professor Acharya, Professor Sani, Dr. Mishra, and Professor Malavarepu for such an intellectually stimulating last session, which has had us captivated. Uh, with that, I request our Honorable Pro-Chancellor, 
Dr. Vidya Yaravdekar, ma'am, to please come on stage and felicitate the panelists. May I now request the director of the School of International Studies, Professor Shivali Lavale, to please come on stage for the wrap-up session. Before Shivali comes in, uh, let me first thank the MEA, uh, specifically uh, the PPR division of MEA, the minister himself for being here, honorable minister for being here, and all the eloquent panelists, uh, erudite speakers. I think this has been one of the best IR conferences uh, more importantly, I could attend it totally sitting there and be a listener, so it was amazing treat for us. And I think all of us need to put our hands together for Shivali. That's why I butted in. She's really done a fantastic job. I mean, she has a very skeletal team of just four members and, of course, a, a huge bunch of students uh, of SSIS. I think we, they also need a great round of applause for being here. So thank you, Shivali. Thank you very much. And... Uh, uh, to specifically uh, Raghuram sir, we would like to say that we would like to continue this endeavor and we hope that you have we, you know, have your trust and faith and you're on our side because this is something very exciting. We certainly want our younger generation and generations to come to listen to what we have discussed over the last two days. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I would like to thank first and foremost the Honorable Minister for being with us and actually mentoring us over the last uh, six months. Uh, it's been an absolute honor. Um, the Ministry of External Affairs, particularly uh, the EM's office and uh, the Policy Planning and Research Division, thank you very much for your kind support. Um, I would also like to thank Ambassador P.S. Raghavan. So thank you very much for your support. Uh, Mr. Vijay Gokhale, who is not here, and of course, our Chair Professor, Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed. They've really been the invisible hands. They have uh, guided us, advised us, and have brought this uh, conference to fruition. Um, I would also like to thank all my colleagues from across the various institutes, uh, the Office of the Pro-Chancellor, uh, Dr. Anita Patankar, uh, Mr. Madhav, uh, and all our colleagues, Amrita, uh, Rupali, uh, thank you very much. And of course, our new Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Raman, thank you, sir, for your, uh, for your support. Uh, thank you, ma'am, uh, Dr. Gupte, uh, we miss you. <laughs> and uh, my students, uh, thank you very much for all the support. They've been uh, working very, very hard over the last uh, six months. And last but not least, my great team. Come on. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Anamika, Dr. Tahir, Dr. Alvait, Dr. Shafat, our doctoral scholars, Kipgin. Hima, a former student who's come back to do a PhD with us. Uh, Bharti Borkar, Namita, Ravi, and of course, Abhikesh and Shubham. And last but not least, my lovely deputy director, Dr. Sukalpa Chakravarti. <laughs> Thank you guys, you did a splendid job. Thank you, uh, Professor Acharya. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mishra. And thank you to all our panelists. Thank you very much. And we look forward to yet another conference next year. Uh, Mr. Raghuram, I hope you're listening. Uh, <laughs> we'd, like, we'd like your support, sir, uh, in continuing with this work. And uh, to borrow a line from Professor Malavarupu's uh, presentation, I think we need to take this forward, uh, you know, in, in concretizing these ideas. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You've been a great audience. Thank you. <laughs>